Elman, Mike Beer, race number nine at Churchill Downs on Kentucky Oaks Friday, the grade two eight bell stakes, three-year-old fillies going seven-eighths of a mile, very competitive group. Before we start with the analysis, remember to head on over to drf.com for your one-stop derby shop. Kentucky Derby packages, past performances, betting strategies, clocker reports, lots more at drf. Dot com. Here's the field for the grade two eight bell stakes, Mike, and it's the first start of the year for the number 10 day out of the office winner of the grade one for and a good second in last year's Breeders' Cup juvenile fillies. Now, in an ideal world, Tim Ham would want to run this horse in the Kentucky Oaks, but she obviously missed some time uh, this year. Now she returns in the eight bells instead. While she's very talented and can easily win, isn't she the kind of horse you want to try to beat at a short price? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, if she is indeed a short price, you probably could take a shot against her. I mean, if nothing else, this is a really, really competitive field. A lot going on in here. Um, a little bit of a belated debut for her. She was a really good two-year-old, though, Dan. Um, in a lot of ways, I think seven furlongs might be her ideal distance, and she appears to be training up a storm. And as we take a look at the time form U.S. pace projector for this race, it's a big field. We expect a fast pace. The five windmill is certainly fast out of there. The four euphoric has gone gate to wire in her last two races. Day out of the office, the 10 is far from a slow horse. But the good news for day out of the office fans is she breaks outside. She has tactical speed and she doesn't need the lead to win. Yeah, I think all those things are true. I do expect there to be um, some pace um, on early in this race. Though. Again, there are a lot of fast horses in here. The number one, Make Mischief, has quietly won three out of her last four races going one turn in New York. She's now back under the care of trainer Mark Cassie. Last year for Cassie, she was multiple graded stakes placed. Let's watch Make Mischief's most recent race at Aqueduct, a one-turn mile over a sloppy track. It's not a big field. She wins very easily. Yeah, wins this race very easily, is going to, you know, sort of easily hold off a three to five favorite um, through the stretch of this race. If nothing else, Dan, she's just really improved uh, as a three-year-old um, for Chris Englehart. Her races are mostly going the one-turn mile um, up there in New York, but she's really taken a step forward as a three-year-old. The only time she's lost this year in the bush or two back, she had absolutely no chance in there. They crawled on a lead in front of her. She was wide every step of the way. Other than that, her form is really good. She just happens to be in a really tough spot here. The number two cantata was one of the more impressive debut winners at Saratoga last year for trainer Steve Asmussen. She ran off the screen to win at six and a half furlongs. And then she just didn't fire, surprisingly enough, against Day out of the office in the grade one for Zet. Asmussen took his time, brought her back at the fairgrounds, and she scored last time out around two turns. Now, she had to work in that race. I think she might be more effective on the cutback. Yeah, I, I agree with you. When I watch her last two races in particular, and, and it, listen, her race off the layoff, uh, two starts back over that sloppy track, that was a really fast and contested pace and a race that went to closers. Um, so she has a big excuse that day. But even the last one, Dan, I mean, she basically cruised for about six or seven furlongs, and then she was all out to get the job done. It, it, she just looks like a horse to me who doesn't want to go that far. Um, when you go back to her for that last year, it was only her second career start. She was three to one against Day Out of the Office and Bequist, who had already won graded stakes races at that meet in Saratoga. Um, they thought highly of this horse last year, and you can see why when you watch her debut, which is the only time she has sprinted in her career. This cutback works for her. There are a couple of other horses cutting back in distance and shipping up from the fairgrounds. Now, the fairgrounds this winter featured some of the better three-year-old fillies in the country, horses like Travel Column and Clarier. The three super sensational tried them in the fairgrounds oaks, the Rachel Alexandra. She came up a little bit short, but now she's facing slightly easier company, perhaps, and she's getting the distance cut back. Let's watch the last time she sprinted. Now, this, of course, over the tapita surface at Woodbine, but boy, she ran great. 87 buyer speed figure and winning the glorious song stakes again turn back to seven is a big angle and she gets a little class relief yeah agreed i, I like all those things about her um just dominated these two horse the two fields um sprinting up at uh, woodbine last year as a two-year-old dominated both of those fields listen i thought she had excuses in the silver bullet day and rachel alexandra not saying she was going to win those races but she had excuses i thought both times last time no excuse i mean she got the right trip and ride in there they put her right on the front the pace wasn't fast She's just not as good as Travel Column or Clarier, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, cutting back really works for her. Um, she's got fine tactical speed. I think she's one of the likely um, horses to win this race. 
The four is euphoric. You're getting 20 to one on the morning line on a filly that's won her last two races by a combined 15 lengths. Now, she won on the lead in both of those races. And last time out, she didn't go necessarily fast against weaker company. The pace is likely to be a lot hotter. And I'm a little concerned about the seven. I'm a little concerned about it, too, especially with a fast pace. I mean, her last two wins, Dan, um, they're every bit as good as they look on paper. She absolutely crushed those two fields. Um, but they were just fields that she was way better than. And that's not the case here. It's a little interesting, though, that her race three back where she didn't make the lead, she actually ran pretty well that day. She did not get a great trip down on the inside, and she ran through the stretch. Windmill, the number five, might very well be the speed of the speed for trainer Larry Jones, jockey Mike Smith. Now, she went fast last time out in that Purple Martin Stakes at Oaklawn Park. She tired late behind Abrogate. She's another filly that's going to have to stretch out an eighth of a mile. Yeah, got to stretch out, um, and she's going to have to do it, I guess, on another fast pace in here, Dan. We'll see how she handles it. I didn't see the excuse for her last time. She didn't run poorly, but she didn't have any excuse at all with Abrogate keeping right up uh, to her outside and out finishing her at the end. I wonder if she's a bounce-back candidate in here, um, because I do think her first two career starts were both pretty good. Slumber Party, the number six, a very impressive debut winner at this distance for trainer Kelly Breen at Gulfstream. She got away to an easy lead, and then she rolled in the stretch over a good field. She then was freshened up. She came back in the Beaumont, the race we're going to show you right now, and she ran just fine. She had to do it a different way, tried to come from off of the pace this time around, and she finishes a solid second. She's done nothing wrong in her career. Her figures are solid. Second off the short layoff for uh, Breen and Arad Ortiz. She's an intriguing contender at what could be a solid price. Yeah, I agree with that. Her debut was good. I mean, she got loose in there, but she ran on that day, and it was a seven furlong race. And this race, she just didn't get a, a great trip in, in here, Dan. I mean, into some traffic there and shuffled back as they came to the stretch right as the winner of that race was taking things over. I thought she chased that home, horse home pretty gamely in 20 character horse who won it. Um, she's finished first in all three of her career starts for Wesley Ward. I mean, that really could be pretty good. Like Super Sensational, the seven obligatory is going to turn back in distance after racing two turns against some good ones in the Fairgrounds Oaks. I liked her win going one turn at Gulfstream, two starts back. She didn't break especially fast. I thought she got shuffled a bit behind a, a dull pace setter on the far turn. Once she got to the outside, she wore down those horses. Now, I don't know how strong that field was, but she looked pretty good. She's well-bred, well-connected, and is going to come running late. Yeah, I agree with all that stuff. I do think she has to improve uh, to beat this field, but I don't see why she couldn't necessarily do that. Um, I, like you, I liked her one uh, her win around in a one-turn mile, two starts back. I thought she ran well that day. I'm not going to hold the Fairgrounds Oaks against her. It was a really good field. She did sort of look like maybe, at, at least at this stage of the game, she just doesn't want to go that far, Dan. She couldn't really keep up around the second turn, but she was racing on at the end. Calypso, the number eight, very briefly on the Kentucky Oaks Trail after winning the Santa Inez at this distance. Bob Baffert very wisely turning her back in distance after she was the beaten favorite in her last two starts, including the Santa Isabel around two turns. Let's watch the Santa Isabel on March the 7th. Calypso, really no excuse in a four-horse field, Mike. It's not like they were going very fast, 48 to the half. She just didn't finish up with Beautiful Gift, who had come back to run second in the Santa Anita Oaks with an 86 buyer. She'll appreciate turning back in distance. Yeah, she will. The one-two finishers of this race are both pretty good, and Calypso just no match for them. And you can see how she's getting a little tired at the end of the race. The last two times she sprinted, they're both stakes wins. Um, I don't think they're against horses like this, Dan. They're also both races where she was just right up there um, on paces that weren't that fast, a totally different situation for her here. And I guess the thing that you would like least about her is, you know, because she's Baffer and Rosario, they got her five to one on the morning line. That feels like a terrible price. The last time Lil Tootsie sprinted, she earned an 89 buyer speed figure in her maiden win at the fairgrounds. She came back to win around two turns. And just consider, she was three to one against Travel Column and Clarier in the fairgrounds Oaks. Now, she didn't fire her best shot, but again, turning back in distance, dropping a little bit in class, and maybe with the right running style for this race. Yeah, I agree with that. The last time she sprinted, she was really impressive winning that race in fast time with Euphoric far behind her um, in second. She ran well that day. She did come back to win in the slop around two turns. That's the Cantata race we were talking about before. The pace was fast and contested. She got a great trip and ride in there to get the job done. Um, so that sort of led them to try the Fairgrounds Oaks last time. At the end of the day, Dan, she just might not be a distance horse. 
day out of the office, the horse to beat, even off the layoff. Let's watch the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. G took the race right to him under Junior Alvarado that day and took him down to about the 16th pole before Vequist finally got the better of her. It was a really nice performance coming on the heels of an excellent Frisette going one turn. And I agree with you. She's probably going to be a one turn seven for a long mile horse uh, in her career. This was a good race around two turns, but you saw her getting tired at the end. Yeah, agreed. I mean, she ran fine in the Breeders' Cup. I feel like at the end of the day, maybe the distance just found her out a little bit there. She just didn't finish the last furlong or so um, and got run down by a pretty nice horse at Bequist. Her prior three starts were all really good. She was a, um, an actually an underrated two-year-old, I would say, Dan, even though she was a grade one winner. Um, you know, coming back at seven furlongs feels like the right thing to do, especially since it, it seems like she missed some time. Unfortunately for her, it feels like she's catching a pretty tough field here right off the bench. She's going to have to be, I think, super tight to beat this field, and you're not going to get much price. Abrogate has won three of four starts. The only loss coming over a tricky, sloppy track in the Dixie Bell Stakes. She rebounded from that effort to win the Purple Martin, a race we're going to look at right now. She beats Windmill in this race. Windmill finishes third. Abrogate got right up close to solid fractions, keeps right on going. I'm just not sure about the quality of the horses that Abrogate beat other than Windmill. Yeah, I, I worry about that too. I, I did like to see her bounce back though and win here because one star prior, it was sort of the reverse where uh, Windmill got the better of her in the stretch this time. She gets the job done to hold on. Um, I think she ran fine. I wonder about seven furlongs in a race like this, Dan. She is a filly who so far wants to be part of the pace. She has to get an extra furlong in a race that they could go fast early. It feels like there's a lot working against her. The Godolphin homebred, the number 12, Caramel Swirl. Well, she found the right spot finally last time out at Keeneland in a maiden race. Let's watch that effort right now. She pushed this pace four wide, took over at will on the turn, and just lengthens to win with an 88 buyer speed figure. Now, she was able to keep close to moderate fractions in that race. They'll go faster here. She might have to come from out of it. But I wonder if this filly is finally starting to live up to her pedigree and potential. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I realize it took her a while to get the maiden win, Dan, but you could see an effort like this coming uh, from a mile away. Her career debut was excellent against Malathot. Her second career start was excellent against Miss Brazil. She just happened not to win either of those races. They finally cut her back at Keeneland. She absolutely crushed that field um, in fast time. I really like her, Dan. I think she's a really good horse. My only problem with her in this spot is um, they somehow made her 12 to one on the morning line. I think she's going to be vying for favoritism in here. Wow. If she's vying for favoritism, I'm in big trouble because we're going to take a look at our top picks in here. And that's where I go. This is a lousy outside post position, I think, for Caramel Swirl. But if she's vying for favoritism, I might have to look elsewhere. I'm going to try to beat Day out of the office with her. However, you're going with Cantata, perhaps to run back to that debut at Saratoga. I just think she's really interesting cutting back. And because she has no figures at all, um, she's just going to be way too big a price uh, for me to resist in this race. I'm going to use her prominently in here. I like Caramel Swirl, Dan. I think she's going to be really tough. Um, her sprint races are all really good. And I just don't want they at the office in this race. I won't be surprised when she wins. But if she's going to be the favorite, I, I want other horses. 2 12 3 6 for Mike, 12 10 4 5 for me. What a war this should be. The grade two eight bells featuring the return of grade one stakes winner, Day Out of the Office.